If you'll join me in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 this morning, we are going to look at verses 14 through 19. Yes, we've moved on from verses 1 through 14, but I had to hold on to verse 14 for one more week, so not completely. The title of our sermon this morning is Enslaved. Our key words for our worshipers in training are slave, righteousness, and obedient. And if you want to follow along in the Blue ESV Bible, you can find our text on page 900. 43. Well, just over 100 years ago, a controversy began to brew that really became significant in the 70s and 80s in evangelicalism. It was called the Lordship Salvation Controversy. And it's very much prominent even today in how people think about the gospel. There are two basic arguments in the controversy, and both of them have very prominent proponents to their side of the controversy. One side of the controversy that we will call the non-lordship side argued that a person could receive the salvation that is offered to us in Jesus Christ, but not receive him as Lord of their life. They define faith in exclusively intellectual terms. A mental assent to what God tells us in the gospel is all that is necessary for salvation. And so one non-lordship proponent wrote that, quote, everyone who is persuaded that Christ's atoning death actually happened as testified by the apostle is justified. In similar fashion, Karl Barth taught that faith is simply believing that because Christ's death and resurrection have happened, one is already justified and an heir of eternal life. In other words, they taught that a person could be confident in their salvation so long as they were persuaded that what the Bible says about Jesus is true, meaning that in their life there was never a need for repentance there was never a need for sanctification, but only an assent to the truth of the gospel. Now, on the other side, the lordship side of the controversy, they did most certainly affirm the need for intellectual assent to the truth of what the Bible teaches about Jesus, but also that if one is truly saved in Christ, that he will then live his life as one who has been transformed by Christ, as a person whose very soul has been changed, whose affections and volition have been transformed, and they are willingly and joyfully living a life of obedience unto God. In other words, the assertion of the Lordship teaching is that Christ is not divided, and one cannot have Christ as their Savior without also having Christ as their Lord. To have one is to have the other, and there cannot be any distinctions made between the two. Those on the lordship side of the controversy have sought to point out that the pastoral effect of the non-lordship position can only be to produce what the Puritans called gospel hypocrites, which are persons who have been told that they are Christians, eternally secure, because they believe that Christ died for them when their hearts are unchanged and they have no personal commitment to Christ at all. So, for clarity's sake, to help us maybe understand this a bit better, let's consider a scenario. Suppose, gentlemen, that when you wanted to get married, you said to the woman that you were proposing to, listen, I want to marry you. I want you to be my wife. However, I'm not going to care about your wants. I'm not going to care about your needs. I'm not going to care about your desires. I'm going to live my life however I please in the end, and you will still love me. You will wash and iron my clothes. You will cook my meals. You will take care of our children. You will speak well of me to others. I will not express my gratitude to you. I will not tell you I love you. We will, in fact, never talk but I want you as my wife. Ladies, 
Who's signing up for that awesome deal? If you're a single woman and you're up for that, please come talk to me before you make any decisions. I think you might need some help. (laughs) Now look, some may say that by painting this scenario, I'm not being fair to the non-lordship position and that I'm reducing everything down to something that is absurd. But in truth, this is exactly what they have argued. You can be saved by Jesus Christ, but you can live as what they call a so-called carnal Christian. No acknowledgement of of God, no prayer, no scripture, no church, no evangelism, no change of life and behavior. In other words, a person can be saved and their life after they are supposedly saved looks exactly the same as it did prior to when they were supposedly saved. Does that sound like any Christianity that you've ever read about in the scriptures? The fact is, the Bible never makes any provision for something called carnal Christianity. You are either a Christian who is united to Christ and transformed by the Holy Spirit, being sanctified as you live your life with Christ, or you are not. There are no other categories in Scripture. Now, interestingly, the reason the lordship salvation controversy came about was because the non-lordship proponents thought that many evangelicals were mistakenly turning the act of repentance into a work that was necessary for salvation. And that is a concern that I very much share with them. I want to be clear. Repentance is not a work to perform in order that one comes to faith in Christ. However, we cannot think of repentance as something wholly distinct from our justification, as if we can be justified and unrepentant in our lives. Is repentance necessary for one to be justified? No. Can you be a Christian who spends eternity with Christ without repentance? No. So we have to think logically about our propositions here. It is wholly impossible that a person without a changed nature could ever come to a place whereby they have first repented and then they have faith, but repentance does follow justification. And if it doesn't, it's not true saving faith. The order matters. In his great work, The Marrow of Modern Divinity, Edward Fisher's two characters, Nomista and Evangelista, spoke on this very issue. Nomista said, I conceive that repentance consists in man's humbling himself before God and sorrowing and grieving for offending him by his sins and in turning from all of that to the Lord. To which Evangelista responded, and would you have a man to do this truly before he ever comes to Christ believing? No, Mr. replied, yea, indeed, I think it is very meet that he should. Evangelista then said, why then, I tell you truly, you would have him do that which is impossible. Godly humiliation in true penance proceeds from the love of God, their good father, and so from the hatred of that sin which has displeased him, and this cannot be without faith. You see, repentance follows faith, and that is important so that when we preach the gospel, we not insist that a person perform a work in order that they might be saved, and yet we cannot think of repentance as something wholly separate from a person's justification in that when they are saved, when they are justified, they will repent. There will be no unrepentant sinners in heaven. So to give them credit, I do believe the concern of non-lordship teachers was a valid concern. However, they turned All of that to mean that we could have all the gifts, we could have all the benefits of Christ without having to submit ourselves in any way to Christ, to which I say they have completely lost their way. In response to the controversy, the late J.I. Packer wrote, If ten years ago you would have told me that I would live to see literate evangelicals, some with doctorates in a seminary teaching record, 
arguing for the reality of an eternal salvation, divinely guaranteed, that may have in it no repentance, no discipleship, no behavioral change, no practical acknowledgement of Christ as Lord of one's life, and no perseverance in faith, I would have told you that you were out of your mind. Stark, starking bonkers is the British phrase I would probably have used, but now the thing has happened. Add that to your vocabulary. <laughs> now, I begin this morning by describing the details of this controversy because I think it's important for us to see that the issue that the Apostle Paul is addressing as we continue in our series through the letter to the Romans are not just ancient problems that we can move away from, but are very much a significant part of what we see in modern evangelical belief today. The most prominently quoted verse among those who are on the non-lordship side of the controversy is Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. You are not under the law, but under grace. But what exactly did Paul mean by that phrase? Was he suggesting that we can simply take Christ as our Savior, but not as our Lord? Was his intention to suggest that the life of the Christian would functionally look no different than the life of one who is unregenerate? Thankfully, as you might have assumed, Paul doesn't just leave us with verse 14, but he goes on to describe precisely what he means, and he offers clarity to us as we think about the important issue this morning. We've spent several weeks now looking at verses 1 through 14, and we are going to now move beyond that to verse 14 through 19. So let's read together beginning in verse 14 of Romans chapter 6. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Now, there are several theological issues that arise in this passage that we're looking at, but it is important to remember that the main thrust is very specific of what Paul is after here. Remember, we're still in the middle of this argument for justification by faith alone. And so he has continued to emphasize the various elements of justification and the conclusions that we should draw based on the fact that our works provide nothing whatsoever to our justification. But Paul is smart, and so as he writes, he continues to anticipate all of the objections that would come from his teaching. You'll recall back in verse 1, he was following on from his statement in chapter 5, when he wrote that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so Paul thought, I know what people are going to say, I know what you're thinking, and so he asks the question, does that mean that we should sin all the more so that grace could abound all the more, and he answers emphatically, by no means. If we are Christians, we have died to sin, and because we have, been, we have died with Christ, we have been resurrected with Christ in a resurrection like his, it is a preposterous claim to think that we would continue in sin. You see, Paul is arguing against the whole idea of the non-lordship crowd all throughout chapter 6. It's quite astonishing that their favorite verse is actually right here in the middle of the chapter. They've completely missed the surrounding context, such is often the case with false doctrine. 
So where does Paul go now with his argument in verses 14 through 19? The first thing that is important for us to see, which is a direct contradiction to what Paul's accusers would have said he was teaching, and so he makes very clear in verses 14 and 15, is that the law of God has not been eliminated. Look again, verse 14, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Why by no means? Notice verse 15. Paul's using that same formulation he used back in verse 1. He presents the likely argument against what he is writing, and then he replies with the emphatic statement, by no means. The King James says, God forbid. In other words, if this is what you think I am saying, you have completely missed my point. Now, I will concede that it is very understandable that one might read this with a bit of confusion. Paul is making some very bold claims about grace abounding over sin and about being under grace and not under law. So it makes sense that those who are not well versed in Scripture would think that Paul is saying that sin doesn't really matter, and that the law has been eliminated, but he responds to both accusations by saying, by no means. That is not the case. This is not at all what Paul is suggesting. So in both verses 1 and 15, Paul is after the very same thing, namely a rejection of the notion that grace somehow sanctions further sin. But we cannot just say that's the case without understanding why. Why is that the case? It would seem reasonable to conclude that perhaps Paul is saying the law is no longer a factor whatsoever. But, and this is the important thing, and here's how we get to this conclusion. If the law is no longer a factor whatsoever, what then do we look to to define what sin is? If the law is no longer a factor, sin is not a thing at all. There is no definition to sin without the law of God. How do we know what sin is? Because God has told us that sin is any transgression of the law of God, as our children learn from their catechism. Sin is any transgression of the law of God. So if the law has been eliminated, so has the very definition of sin. We don't know what sin is. So what then is the role that the law plays? This is an important clarification for us to make. It may seem a bit of a detour to you, but I think it'll be helpful as we move forward, because we do not want to become either legalists as it pertains to the law or antinomians, those who think the law does not matter. Now, here, when we're talking about the law, it seems most certain that Paul is referring specifically to the moral law of God and not the civil or ceremonial laws of God. The ceremonial law of God was abrogated in Christ's life. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And the civil law was given for the people of Israel as they lived upon the land of Israel given to them by God under his theocratic rule. And so it too has been abrogated because we do not live in a theocracy in that sense. But the moral law of God, the eternal moral law of God is that law which was given at the very beginning. We saw that just a few weeks ago and even back in the early chapters of Romans. The law of God is written on the heart of every man, woman, or child as they are created in the womb. And it's reiterated once again for us to see on the tablets of stone when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. And so when we're talking about the moral law of God, we are referring specifically to the Ten Commandments. All Ten Commandments, even that pesky fourth one, all Ten Commandments, and they are still very much part of what we look to today in order that we understand what sin actually is. So then, what use is the law for us if what Paul is saying is true? If we are under grace 
but not under the law. And what does that really mean? The law can be understood to have three main functions or uses. Often you'll hear me talk of the first or the third use of the law. What are those uses? The first use of the law is what Paul describes elsewhere as a schoolmaster or a taskmaster. In this use, the law shows us God's perfect requirements that must be fulfilled for one to live a life righteously before God. And the standard to fulfill that purpose of the law is absolute perfection. So it's a schoolmaster in that it shows us immediately that we cannot do what it requires. It teaches us that there is no possible way that we could ever fulfill God's standard of righteousness. Whether they recognize it or not, every unregenerate person I have ever met will at least admit that they are not perfect. And the reason they admit they are not perfect is because God's law is written on their heart and they know that they have broken it. And if you are not perfect, according to God's law, you have no ground on your own upon which you can stand before God that he would be pleased to declare you righteous. Perfection is his standard. As Jesus said, be perfect as I am perfect. You remain in Adam. If you are not in Christ, and that is a problem because you cannot fulfill the law and you will fall far short of what God requires. And the point in doing that is to drive you. The point in giving the law to show you that standard is to drive you to see your need of Christ. It's the schoolmaster, the taskmaster that shows you, you can't do this, you need Christ. You need the righteousness of another because you have nothing on your own to provide that will commend you to God. That's the first use of the law. The second use of the law is rarely discussed, but it is what the law does in the hearts of men to keep them from doing which they are capable of. In other words, even an unregenerate person has a conscience, is an, and, it, and that conscience is in some way informed by the law of God that was written on their heart to various degrees. And the, the very threat of punishment, the very reality that comes from breaking the law is made evident in that it is often, a ref, is often reflected in our civil legal code. In other words, most people will not murder their neighbor. Not because they don't want to, because you hate raking their leaves in your yard. I get it. Trust me, I get it. And it may not be that you, you don't murder them, not because you don't want to, and certainly not because you're not capable of doing so, but because the law strikes fear in them that to do so would lead to punishment. Their conscience is convicted by the law of God, which tells them, do not murder. So the law functions as a restraint on human behavior. That's the second use of the law. The third use of the law, and this is very important for us, and we'll get this much more significantly in chapter 12 and beyond in Romans. The law of God functions as a rule of life for those who are in Christ. So prior to our justification... Think of this logically. The law drives us to Christ, to see our need for Christ. And when we are in Christ, the law shows us what it looks like to live a life that is pleasing to God, to live a life that honors and glorifies God on his terms. It doesn't exist to show us that we are required to fulfill it perfectly because we have already been shown that we cannot. But Christ has fulfilled the law for us to perfection. And since he fulfilled the law for us, and since those of us who are in Christ have truly been transformed by the gospel, we have new hearts of obedience. We can now look to the law, not as a threat, not as a barrier to living free and, and full lives, but rather with a loving to desire to do what God commands because we know that his commands are exactly what is best for us. So we love the law as Christians, right? It's as the psalmist says, I delight in God's law and all that it is, and I want to fulfill God's law so far as I am able because I know that to do so pleases God and is good and right for me. 
The circumstances of my life will be such that it turns out well for me as I look to God's law and seek to live according to it. And I love that. I don't despise that as I once did prior to being a Christian. So you see, the law of God is still very much in play. So what does Paul mean when he says we are not under the law, but we are under grace? We looked at this briefly last week and said that what Paul means is that we are no longer under the weighty burden of the law. In other words, we're no longer oppressed by the guilt and the burden of judgment that comes as a result of the law. We're not obligated to uphold the law so that we will be saved. Rather, we can now look to the law with thankfulness because God has shown us how to live happy, peaceful, productive, and godly lives. If you are in Christ, you should have a delight in God's law and not despise it in all of its various facets. You should be delighted that when you sin, you need not live in fear of judgment. You need not live in fear of condemnation because the law has been fulfilled by Christ in your place. You should have great joy in knowing that God has graciously defined for us what it means to live a godly, moral life and that he's not left us guessing from day to day how it is that we ought to live. And honestly... You cannot think of a single moral issue in life that is not somehow addressed by at least one of the Ten Commandments. And that is amazing to me, that we live in a time and in a land where there are thousands upon thousands of laws that govern our daily lives and interactions, and yet God masterfully laid out for us exactly what we need to know in order to live unto Him in the Decalogue alone. He didn't need 4,000 page bills in Congress. He just needed 10 words. And those 10 words are still very much active and present in the world today. You are either condemned by the law of God because you cannot fulfill it, or Christ has fulfilled it for you and you can delight in it because it is your rule of life. Those are the only two options. So hopefully you can see that it is absolutely preposterous to ever make the claim that we should just go on sinning because we are under grace and not under law. What nonsense. It is precisely because of God's grace that we have the law and we can see the law for what it is and for what it does for our good. So are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Secondly, verses 16 through 18, Paul shows us that you are a slave to whatever you obey. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now, to rightly understand Paul's meaning here, we have to understand something about indentured servitude. When we think of slaves, we tend to think of the horrible, evil slave trade in the West in more recent centuries, man-stealing. We think of slavery as kidnapping young people from Africa, bringing them across the ocean, placing them on the auction block, separating from their families, and selling them to other people. That, however, is not what Paul has in mind here as he uses this term. In the ancient world, slavery was primarily voluntary servitude. It worked in such a way that when someone had a debt he could not pay, he would offer his services, his labor, to fulfill the debt. And the terms of that service would be agreed upon between the master and the slave, or what the Bible often calls the bondservant. This is then the context in which Paul asks, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, bondservants, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? What Paul is saying is that 
as we present ourselves, if we present ourselves again to sin, as slaves to sin, it will lead to death. If we obey sin as a slave, the only outcome is death. On the contrary, however, if we present ourselves as slaves to obedience, then the end is righteousness. You can only have one master when you are a slave. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, in this context, we are a slave to something and we all have a master. Either we are slaves to sin or we are slaves to righteousness, which is to say we are slaves to Christ. What or whom do you obey? That is the question. Whatever or whomever that is, that is your master. There's a great quote from a book called Out of the Salt Shaker, and it says, Whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. So we can say we offer ourselves to whatever we seek as our highest good in life, whether power or acceptance or some cause out there, then we become slaves of whatever that may be. And so no one is in control of his or her life. You're not in control. We are controlled by that to which we have offered ourselves. Whether we call ourselves religious or not, we all have a God. Everyone is a worshiper. But notice the sort of paradoxical way in which Paul describes this. It's fascinating. We, we might think of being a bondservant in negative terms, but look at what Paul writes. He says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. He describes our becoming slaves of righteousness in glowing terms, doesn't he? Thanks be to God. But we understand that, hopefully. We ought to thank God that we are no longer enslaved to sin. Instead, we now have the gracious, loving, merciful, patient master who is Christ who did what we couldn't do and freed us to live joyful, abundant lives in him. This is the happiest enslavement in all the world because we are in service to Christ who gives us perfect freedom. So you see, it is wholly diabolical that one would ever suggest that we could take Jesus as our Savior, but not as our Lord. If Jesus is not your Lord, if Jesus is not your master, if you are not a slave to Christ, you are a slave to sin. And to be a slave to sin is truly a sin indeed because it leads to death. When you are united to Christ, you embrace him as Lord, you embrace him as master. You cannot be a justified believer without being a believer who submits himself or herself to Christ's lordship. It is inconceivable that you would ever come to Jesus to save you, but not yield yourself to him. When Jesus grabs hold of you, you are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, you are given a new heart, and when you are given a new heart, your desire is now to not live independently from God, but to be fully dependent upon Him in every manner of life as a bondservant, because you know you can't live without Him. And when you're a bondservant of Christ, you have a freedom that you cannot have in any other way in this life. You may think you're free. You may think you're living free by doing what you want in the way you want it in obstinance against God and disobedience to God, but you are not free. You are a slave and you're as good as dead. You need to be enslaved to Christ. And what that means is that we can be the kind of believers that we would have the instinct now to look at sin 
as it presents itself. And instead of obey sin, because it is no longer our master, instead we can look at it, recognize it for what it is, compare it to God's law, and when we ask, am I going to do that? Am I going to say that? I now have the ability, I now have the opportunity to say, by no means. By no means. We want to be the kinds of people who look at disobedience to God. And when we might have a wild thought that it's okay to disobey God because we're under grace, that we would instantly say, no, by no means is that okay. I want to please God. After all, remember, it is Christ himself who said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And as a Christian, you are capable of doing that because you're not obligated to sin, albeit imperfectly. Now, it's helpful to see how Paul compares and contrasts these two slaveries in terms of their origin in verses 17 and 18. Notice first where Paul wrote that those of you who are in Christ were once slaves of sin. And in Greek grammar, it's understood that what Paul is writing here is to imply that this is what we are by nature apart from Christ. This is our natural state of being. He's bringing us right back to his argument in chapter 5, namely that slavery to sin begins automatically when we come into this life. We are born into sin because we are born in Adam. But look at what else he writes. The Christian has become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. So let's think about those parts very quickly. Paul mentions first the standard of teaching. What he means is that true conversion, our justification, begins with an announcement. And that announcement is the gospel. It is a specific message with a specific content that must be received and believed in order that one be a believer. And that is the true gospel. Paul also says that this is something that is obeyed. In other words, when that gospel truth penetrates the heart, it shows itself in real life change. There is really a difference in a person's life when they truly become a Christian. There is obedience that comes from faith, which is something Paul mentioned all the way back in chapter 1. Paul also says that this is from the heart. He means that the, tr the truth convicts and affects the human heart. Before the gospel ever hits the heart, it is entirely possible to have a merely intellectual or behavioral so-called Christianity in which there is a superficial following of Christian moral principles, but it's moralism at best. And it is not true conversion. It is not true Christianity. This is exactly what it looks like if you think you have Christ as your Savior, but you don't want him as your Lord. It's to fool yourself if there is ever any thought of any such thing that it would be possible. True faith in Christ is from the heart. And from the heart comes all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our actions. So, in summary, slavery to sin begins at our birth. Slavery to God begins at our new birth. When God's grace enables us to embrace the gospel in our hearts, changing our motives, resulting in a total change of life. So what does that lead to? Paul shows us finally this morning in verse 19 that righteousness leads to sanctification. He writes, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Notice here that Paul shows us that the development of slavery to sin and slavery to God are very similar. Each kind of slavery proceeds and advances and neither one of them stands still. Notice he writes that slavery to sin results in more and more sin. Lawlessness leads to more and more lawlessness. We become callous to it, and we continue to do it more. And this lawlessness become, uh, comes because the imperatives of the Lord uh, come clear in our lives. The thing we serve, we're seeking to work out their will in this world through our bodies, whatever that Lord is to us. 
as we act out of a particular purpose, the action shapes our character and our will so that it becomes easier to act on that particular thing. So offering our bodies to sin leads to impurity and to an ever-increasing cycle of sin or lawlessness. And you know that in your own life, right? We've known that since childhood. And what happens? What happens when you get older? What happens when you get a lot older? You get a little more impatient with certain things, right? You yell at all the kids on your lawn. You get a little more grouchy about certain things. You become a bit more grumpy from day to day, right? Those are the tendencies that start to sink in if we don't continually look to Christ to sanctify in the, us in those areas. But we don't want to be grumpy old men and women, do we? We want to be the most humble, gracious, patient, kind, loving, servant-hearted old people. <laughs> I'll just say it in all of humanity, right? Because we are slaves to righteousness, not sin. That's not easy. It's not easy. In contemplating the ever-increasing nature of sin, C.S. Lewis wrote, he said, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever. And this must be either true or false. Now, there are a good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were only going to live for 70 years, but which I had, pretty, I, I had better bother about very seriously if I'm going to live forever. Perhaps my bad temper or my jealousy or, uh, or such things are gradually getting worse so gradually that the increase in 70 years would be not that noticeable. But it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is precisely the correct technical term for what it would be. Imagine where your grumpiness could be in a million years if it was not checked by the grace of God. But notice... Paul shows us that slavery to God works in a similar way. Offering ourselves as slaves to righteousness leads to sanctification. As we live according to the truth, our character and our will are shaped into habits of holiness and of righteousness. It's not overnight. It is progressive. That's why we talk about progressive sanctification. It happens over the life of the Christian. So what does that mean? It means that we can live out, maintain, and enjoy our freedom from sin. We are free to present our members, all that we are, all that we have in our bodies, we can present, and we are free to present for righteousness' sake. So you see, we have an obligation to present ourselves. That means that we have the rule of life, which is God's law. We have the freedom and the ability to live according to God's standard, free from sin. So what now? Well, now we must do it. We must live it out. It's really that simple. We must remember that verse 19 comes after verse 18, where Paul tells us, you have been set free from sin. And as we saw in the last two chapters, conversion brings us into this new realm, under this new power, the power of grace, the realm of grace, the reign of grace instead of the reign of sin and the reign of Adam. And we have this new ability within us to resist sin. We're no longer obligated to obey sin. Sin can no longer force us to do anything. So when we get to verse 19, he says, now present your members as slaves to righteousness. Paul is saying, be what you are. If you're a Christian, be what you are. Be controlled in your behavior, not by feelings, not by appearances, but by the reality of what the gospel tells you, of who you are and what has been done for you that you could be who you are. If you obey sin, you are neglecting your new nature. You are being what you were not made to be in Christ. Christ. 
And so that means coming daily to our situations in life and recognizing the possibility of treating God as my highest good and thus my master or of treating something else as my highest good or thus my master. Which will it be? For example, if someone says something that makes me look bad, I will offer my slave as a slave to God or a slave to sin in that moment. I could let my desire to look bad good be my master. I could let my heart say, this is a disaster. I I look like a fool. I am am being discredited by this person, and everyone around me is going to think differently of me. I must pay them back. That's one way we could do that, and at that point, if I act out of this kind of, of thing... I will respond with bitterness, I will respond with with harsh language, and so on and so forth. Or, I could remember that pleasing Christ is my ruling motivation, and I could have my heart to say, well, that person has pointed out, albeit with a hateful motive, a flaw that I really should deal with. But fortunately, God is my judge, God has accepted me in Jesus Christ, And if I act out of that kind of thinking, I will repent in my heart before God for what I truly am guilty of and respond with a soft answer to the person who made the point. Do you see the difference? Same criticism, vastly different response. What are you a slave to? Your reputation? How you look before others? Whether or not you look powerful and mighty and having it all together, or are you a slave to Christ? Are you a slave to the one who has given you new life in him? Are you a slave to sin? Are you enslaved to righteousness? The fact of the matter is that if you are not in Christ, you are a slave to sin. And yet you need not remain a slave to sin. The Bible makes very clear to us That Jesus Christ came into this world to live a perfect life to fulfill the moral, civil, and ceremonial law of God so that in him you might have everlasting life. He lived that life because we cannot live that life. He died the death we deserve because we could not live that life. We deserve death. We deserve condemnation. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's wrath. And yet Christ took it all upon himself on the cross so that we could look to him as our atoning sacrifice, knowing that the Father looks to Christ's death as atoning for the sins of all who trust in him. Jesus was raised from the dead three days later to defeat, to conquer, to rule over sin and death, that we need no longer be enslaved to sin, but rather to be enslaved to righteousness, to Christ alone. And so, what do the scriptures tell us? That by faith alone, we would come to Christ and that in Christ alone, our hearts would be transformed that we could be the new man or the new woman who desires to delight in the law of God that we might walk in righteousness. Do you walk in righteousness with Christ or do you continue in sin? Christ is for you. Christ is calling you that you might come and trust in him. Will you believe upon Christ today? For today is the day of salvation.